I'm going to greet everyone and um, introduce myself and introduce the panelists for the evening. My name is Bill Valerio. I'm the director of Woodmere. I'm watching the number of participants um, jump up second by second. So um, just while everyone is joining, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. This is a community update on Woodmere's very exciting project and our shared community project to transform the building known as St. Michael's Hall into a 21st century museum building, a part of Woodmere Art Museum that will be um, very much a well, an exciting center that does a lot of things. I was about to say it's going to um, offer galleries for our collection, but it's going to do so, it's going to do that and more. And part of the goal of our meeting tonight is to share what that more is. Um, take our time in describing what our plans are um, so that we can unwind it and give all of you the opportunity to ask questions um, and engage with us as this process goes forward. I'm, I'm joined tonight by um, the extraordinary team of people that um, Woodmere is working with to undertake this project to transform St. Michael's Hall. I'm with Matthew Baird of Matthew Baird Architects and with Matthew, Teresa Ball and Le G in Matthew Baird Architects office. Um, Jeff Krieger, who's the local architect on this project, and Darren Damone representing Andrew Pogon, landscape architects who are the landscape architects involved in the project. We are recording this session and we're also asking you to please um, put any questions in the Q&A. Ann Standish is not visible, but she's with us and she's going to monitor the Q&As. Um, you know, if for some reason something goes wrong with the screen or um, there's something burning that needs to be asked, you know, now, please um, don't be shy and say, Anne, can you please ask Bill now this question or that question or the same, Matthew, Darren, um, Jeff. So um, we're going to dive into this and um, share um, information about a project that we are incredibly excited about. And, um, you know, we are incredibly grateful to all of you for joining us tonight, but this is a community wide project. This is not about Woodmere. This is not about me. It's not about Matthew Baird architects or Jeff Krieger and associates or Andrew Pogon. It's about everybody um, pulling together. It has been that kind of effort to get us to where we are now. And it's going to be that kind of effort of everybody on board um, moving, moving forward. So uh, here we go. I'm going to advance the slides or the slide. What you see is a, you know, a, a view from Google Earth showing uh, Germantown Avenue with Woodmere on the upper left and um, St. Michael's Hall, the lower right. Ah, uh, thank you. Whoever drew that lasso. Um, Ta-da. And uh, many, of, many of you have heard me say there are 72 steps between the two properties that's walking from the corner of Germantown Avenue and Bells Mill Road and the corner of Hampton Road in Germantown. Uh, we are envisioning that Woodmere remains one museum that nonetheless has different functions and different activities in two separate buildings. In Woodmere's main building, the building with our tower, um, that is a 20,000 square foot building on six acres. Woodmere's Founders Collection will remain on view there. 19th century art will remain on view there. And special exhibitions, the changing exhibitions that we offer in our great rotunda shaped gallery, the Cook and Del Bueno Gallery, those will remain on view at Woodmere. Our Millard Gallery for Children's Art, which for a lot of people is a favorite part of the museum, will remain at Woodmere's main site. And the Widener Painting Studio, the Carriage House Painting Studio, is a studio, an art painting studio for adults. 
Sometimes we convert it over to being a studio for children to make art, but um, you know, that's a difficult process. Um, you know, children's art making and adult art making don't necessarily go together. Um, adults use razor blades. We cannot allow children to use razor blades. Adults use turpentine. We cannot allow children to use turpentine. And the list goes on. One of the things that St. Michael's Hall allows for us to do is you know, to really, to, to realize a dream and to complement the art studio for adults with an art studio that is designed specifically for children, a kind of drop-in place. Um, museums across the country have experimented with drop-in studios for children to make art. Um, I'm not aware of one that exists um, around the year um, in Philadelphia, and I just couldn't be excited that the 17,000 square feet um, of St. Michael's Hall allows us to re realize those kinds of dreams. It will be um, St. Michael's will be will, will be transformed into a gallery building for Woodmere's collection of 20th and 21st century art. And so, um, you know, you see slides of a contemporary installation and an installation of murals, the, the House of Wisdom murals by Violet Oakley, which are among the great masterpieces that we have in the collection at Woodmere, we will be able to create a gallery to house those murals in the manner in which Violet Oakley imagined they would exist in relation um, to each other. And that truly is transformative for Woodmere because Woodmere has one of the great collections of American art, and that is the God's honest truth I'm not just saying that, even though I'm biased, but um, people don't know the strength of Woodmere's collection and that Woodmere's collection should be considered, um, you know, at, at the highest level of importance in terms of art museums and having galleries for, you know, the display of the strengths of the collection will really change that and elevate Woodmere's status across the spectrum um, of American art museums. Um, we are also thinking about the landscapes, the, the outdoor space of both campuses in tandem with each other. And so um, you've seen um, many of you in the, I, 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 many of you in the community have, have walked Woodmere Six Acres. You've seen the amazing Hugel Garden and all of the um, art and creativity merging with nature as an education experience at, on Woodmere's main campus, um, we're taking that same kind of thinking to the four acre campus um, at St. Michael's Hall. And you will hear more about that from Darren Damone and Andrew Pogon, but I'm just gonna show, you know, just a few slides of, of Woodmere's campus. There in the upper left are the amazing hoogles made by Sid Carpenter and um, Steve Donegan. Um, the hoogles, you know, have been sleeping all winter. They are bursting with energy. Um, I checked them out over the weekend myself and, you know, all the plants and all the things are um, emerging um, from the logs. It's pretty cool to see. And, you know, we're taking that kind of creative creativity. How do we work with nature in a creative way across um, the St. Michael's campus? We are continuing our creative learning landscape approach, and I'm reminding everyone of how um, we sometimes teach fractions at the museum. There's uh, Dina Wynn's Spring and Triangle with 12 bales of hay that are placed to respond to the shapes in the sculpture, and we used this through the two years of the pandemic inviting fourth graders where fractions are the curriculum um, fourth graders can live the idea of four is a third of 12 or three is a fourth of you know um, that, that you can understand the idea of the fraction and the relationship of threes and fours to the number 12 if you can jump on it live it walk on it go in between it and that kind of deliberate education outcome um, in terms of how we um, engage with the landscape will continue at St. Michael's Hall. 
In the lower right are um, the big stone blocks that create our step pools to control stormwater management, which is, I know, a favorite part of the landscape for a lot of people. We get lots of nice notes and letters um, about the step pools and you know, the openness of the stormwater management um, elements and, and the natural um, you know, focus on, on how we um, work with stormwater management. And then in the lower left, um, the Francis M. McGuire Outdoor Classroom, which um, is about to start getting built. This is a stone terrace for um, adults and children um, to sit and make art. What's so important there is that it's a handicap accessible terrace, um, in essence, made out of stone that you know, will be a place for outdoor art classes, place something we've always needed because we really haven't had a place um, in our very steep landscape where a classroom um, where there are accessibility issues can fully engage you know, with the outdoor um, spaces that we have. So this is the approach um, to the landscape on Woodmere's existing campus. And just a few slides, um, these will come back later, um, but a few slides to give a sense of how we're thinking about the landscape and the building and the interaction between the two at St. Michael's Hall. So um, Darren Damone will talk about the different zones of the landscape and how he's thinking about those zones creatively in terms of meadows, groves, um, buffers, and, and so forth. But we really are looking at you know, um, you know, a creative landscape where we can do paper making, where we can grow plants that can be used for dyes. And you know, there's a rendering made by Matthew and his team of you know, what the kitchen, <laughs> the old kitchen in the mansion will look like as a studio space for children connected to the outdoors, as you see below, and a place where children can you know, engage with art in a hands-on kind of way. Um, we have been incredibly grateful to so many people who have responded to our project favorably, um, supporting the protection of the green space and the ecosystem. Jeff will speak a little bit about you know, what the option could have been for this property. Um, as well as the preservation of the great historic house. St. Michael's Hall was built as a residence um, starting in the 1850s and um, was renovated in the 1890s. It became a convent, a residence for the Sisters of St. Joseph's in 1924 until Woodmere purchased the building in the fall of 2021. So for almost 100 years, the Sisters of St. Joseph's um, cared for and preserved St. Michael's as their home. They did a great job of preserving the building. The beautiful historic details um, remain as do the gorgeous outdoor spaces and great um, you know, majestic trees of the estate, which we're very excited about. Um, and we are also very excited um, to have been awarded the John Andrew Gallery Community Award this was a nomination that came from Lori Selganikoff at the Chestnut Hill Conservancy, nominated this project for um, something that I consider the most prestigious preservation award that there is because it's not for a project, it's for a community that comes together and achieves a conservation minded um, goal, in this case, um, saving St. Michael's Hall. Uh, we were able to acquire this great property as a result of you know, more than 300 contribute more than 300 individual people made contributions to this project and we could not be more grateful and it was not just contributions but it was you know throwing you know throwing the muscle in to make the project happen so um, we are very grateful to the Preservation Alliance, and um, I hope everybody will be on the lookout for the award ceremony um, this coming this coming spring. But this is an award shared by everyone on the Zoom call. Um, I want to take everybody inside the house and really talk a little bit about 
you know, Woodmere's collection and why it is that I'm so excited about this opportunity and, you know, to give a sense of, um, you know, what is so special about Woodmere's collection and why I believe it deserves an extraordinary place um, like St. Michael's Hall. Um, I was very excited to be approached by one of the descendants of the woman who built the house, um, Louisa Farr Trotter um, and her husband, William Henry Trotter, built St. Michael's in 1855. They had a house downtown in Philadelphia and they bought the parcel of land and built the house in 1855. And um, I was very honored that a descendant of Mrs. Trotter reached out and made it possible for Woodmere to acquire this portrait of her that hung in the house originally by Thomas Sully. Mrs. Trotter was English, so was Thomas Sully. Um, and, you know, although the portrait wasn't dated, we looked at that hairdo and said, huh, you know, it can only date to one year, and that's 1850 or, you know, 1851, 52, when Queen Victoria adopted that specific um, kind of curve under the ear um, hairdo. That is a picture of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert on the cover of a manual for dancing. And in true Victorian fashion, it's a manual of how a couple can dance together, but, you know, not touch each other in unnecessary ways in public. So it's, you know, it's all about this new morality of the Victorian era. And, you know, I think, you know, the Englishness of the Trotters is an interesting thing for us to think about as we um, get deep into the building. But I'm very happy that Mrs. Trotter has come home. Um, she's actually in the conservation studio of Stephen Arasati right now, and she's going to look better than she's looked in 200 years. <laughs> um, I'm going to take everybody on a brief tour through St. Michael's Hall and describe um, how it is that we're planning to display Woodmere's collection. Our vision is that um, the entrance experience will be an experience with contemporary art, and we will go back in time as we go up through um, the building. Um, there are specific aspects of contemporary art that will be intertwined as we think about these three galleries. And we're also thinking about site-specific placements of works of art in Woodmere's collection or gifts to Woodmere um, that have been made in recent years that you know we've never really had a place um, to put. And so I'm showing this amazing vessel by the incredible artist ceramicist Bill Daly, who recently passed away. And you know, I can only imagine, you know, this incredible urn, which is um, you know, it, it, it has gravity and presence. It's the sort of thing that I imagine people walking in and experiencing. And, you know, in this entrance hall, and you see the entrance hall, this is the room you walk into when you walk in the front door. Um, I'm imagining that just bursting with color. Um, one aspect of contemporary art, contemporary painting that I really love in Philadelphia is a kind of gestural, brightly colored um, contemporary art. I'm showing a vertical painting by um, my friend Bill Scott and um, Keita Broadhead, who was his mentor in a way. And I'm just imagining, um, you know, this this kind of contemporary art that has a deep history tied into Philadelphia modernism in terms of its high keyed color. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking about just, you know, the energy that, that this kind of art can bring into the building. Um, contemporary art is a, um, is a global conversation of diverse voices. That's what contemporary art is in Philadelphia. Woodmere has grown its collection um, in that direction. So I'm showing paintings by Ed Bing Lee, by Henry Bermudez, and by Jonathan Lydon Chase to give examples of the kinds of, you know, what I believe are very important works of contemporary art that will fill these spaces. And I'm not just saying that we're going to put, um, you know, all these pieces in the same gallery we will probably achieve some level of integration but I'm describing, you know, what I think are some of the main anchoring forces in the contemporary art of Woodmere's collection. 
Um, when we choose works of art to be on view, one of the first things I do is I speak to the educators um, on, on Woodmere staff, and there are certain paintings that I have already promised will be there um, for children. One of them is a very large vertical painting called Razzle Dazzle by my great friend Frank Bramblett, um, who sadly recently passed away. Frank, you know, one of the great artists of Philadelphia, um, gave shape to the Tyler School of Art in his generation and very much contributed to the strength of that school as we know it today. Um, and then A Bird Buys a House by another great friend, Peter Payone, who's a family member at Woodmere and a painting that um, we know um, children visiting with their families never get tired of seeing or that um, offers so much as a painting to visiting classroom groups. So when we think about you know, galleries for contemporary art at Woodmere, you know, our educators are always part of the conversation. And you should expect to see works like Razzle Dazzle and A Bird Buys a House. Um, abstract painting, whether it's hard edge and pop-like or it's um, atmospheric and, and painterly, um, will also have a home um, in St. Michael's Hall. And I'm showing works by Nisa Grassi, Warren Rohr, Edna Andrade and Elaine Kurtz, artists, um, you know, all of these artists and, and all the artists that I've described already being figures that, you know, Woodmere has a very sincere commitment to that we believe in and we believe it's our responsibility in part to, to sustain their legacies. And then there is a spectacular breakfast room. I believe I showed a view of the dining room earlier um, the breakfast room gets beautiful light in the early parts of the day. And um, there's something very sensuous about the incredible carving of the wood in that room. The wood carver for this building was a man named Edward Main, who had a spectacular fluidity to his ability to create organic forms in wood. He was definitely on the A list of craftsmen that you wanted to be part of your house if in the 1890s or 1910s you were building a great home. And there's something about the fluidity and the, the qualities of Edward Main's carving that makes me want to fill this room with sculpture that has that kind of tactile presence. And so Again, this is preliminary. I'm not promising that these specific works of art are going to land exactly there, but I'm showing works by, um, again, my friend Sim Carpenter, um, uh, unglazed porcelain ceramics by Rudy Staffel, um, and then on the right, a spill cast sculpture, um, a recent gift to Woodmere um, by Harry Bertoya. Um, this was a preparatory work for the huge installation that he made at the Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C. Um, a very gorgeous, tall um, um, sculpture that, um, you know, where molten, molten bronze interacts with nature to create that incredible surface. Um, going upstairs, the conversation continues. Um, keeping it real will be about the realist tradition in modern and contemporary art in Philadelphia. Philadelphia modernism will really, you know, look back at the modernist movement, artists like Arthur Carls and others, um, women artists and a gallery dedicated to Violet Oakley and the House of Wisdom, and then a gallery, um, the, the, the main bedroom, which gets beautiful sunsets every day, will um, be a place for Woodmere's important collection of American Impressionism as it evolved um, in Philadelphia. And I'm going to run through these very quickly to give a sense of some of the artists in Woodmere's collection that, you know, again, we are very much dedicated to that I imagine filling these galleries. Um, I'm calling it keeping it real for now. And, you know, we are almost thinking that each of the, these sets of galleries will have a title, like keeping it real. Um, artists who had to rethink what, the, what, what does it mean to paint what's in front of you or to use things that are in front of you to create a narrative or a tableau? 
And I'm showing works by Bo Bartlett on the upper right, Larry Day, a painting of the Philadelphia Waterworks. It's a really interesting um, view of the waterworks from inside one building looking out on the others. Um, and then um, in the lower left um, by Penelope Harris, I, another Woodmere favorite painting, we get asked for it all the time to be on view, Blue Beads. And, you know, this is literally true. There are certain works of art in our collection that people want to see, that people feel like they have a relationship with. And having a gallery where these paintings can be on view allows that to take place, not only for our community and for our visitors, but for school teachers. The idea that works of art can be on view long term means a teacher can integrate a painting into, you know, say, a curriculum that can be useful you know, over many years. Um, and, you know, and again, that is a game changer for Woodmere in terms of the basic expression of the mission. Um, American Impressionism as it evolved in Philadelphia. Um, I have decided I am no longer going to call this Pennsylvania Impressionism. I think that that gives the false impression that um, these, this is a movement of artists who lived out in Bucks County. Some of them did, but really the heart of Impressionism in, in Philadelphia, of American Impressionism in Philadelphia is Philadelphia. Um, the exhibition that's on view right now um, tells a story about, um, you know, a colony in Bucks County, but a school in Philadelphia, that is the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, that recruited artists who had worked in Paris in the 1870s and brought Impressionism to America. This is a very important story that needs to be filled out in American art. And Woodmere's collection is the only collection um, that I believe can do this. Um, we will be able, uh, what's very wonderful, um, the Schofield family um, has elected to name this gallery, which is to say that they've made a, a very generous gift that you know helps us um, fund the creation of this space. And for that, we put their name on the gallery. There are lots of opportunities like that um, throughout the building, but um, I couldn't be more excited. Um, paintings like Wissahickon in Winter by Schofield, which could almost be sort of, you know, the mascot for, for Woodmere and for Chestnut Hill, will have a place to be on view um, in perpetuity. I'm excited about that. I've already shown this image, um, which is a, you know, Photoshop mock-up of what it would look like to create a beautiful gallery for those um, massive murals by Violet Oakley. Um, a gallery, um, Mad for Modern, I'm calling it, um, just for now, Mad for Modern in Philly, Arthur Carls, Henry McCarter, um, you know, again, like the Impressionist artists of a generation before, graduate from the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, go to Paris, live there. Um, Arthur Carls, um, you know, became friendly with Matisse, Picasso, Brock, just as Henry McCarter just a few years earlier. Um, you know, worked with Toulouse-Lautrec and Van Gogh and brought these ideas of modernism um, to America and helped shape modernism in American art as other artists did in New York and elsewhere. But what's so interesting to me about modernism in Philadelphia is no matter where you look, you get this incredible high keyed, intense color, a kind of fauvism that meets cubism. Um, and, and we don't get that. Um, I don't think um, in other traditions in other cities, Philadelphia has this very specific kind of modern um, energy. And um, I'm showing in the little right, a painting from the 1950s by Sam Feinstein. We re recently showed um, a view, um, a, an exhibition about the artists of group 55, um, which in a lot of ways is the culmination of this modernist movement in Philadelphia and the beginning of things that came after. So I'm very happy that we can, you know, have the opportunity to show, you know, you know the development of this intense um, color based um, abstraction in the city um, in Philadelphia. I'm also showing works by Jesse Drew Bear and, and Salvatore Pinto that are figurative that are also very much um, a part of this story. Um, 
Woodmere has 2,000 works of art by Violet Oakley in its collection. And so um, I'm thinking about this very grand staircase and second story entrance central hall and how it will be filled floor to ceiling with works by Violet Oakley, Edith Emerson, her life partner, who was Woodmere's director for, um, for almost 40 years. I'm showing lower left Violet's portrait of Edith, lower center, um, Edith's portrait of Violet in their home, Hogsley. Um, up above, a portrait of the Butcher children by their friend, Jesse Wilcox Smith. Together, they formed the Red Rose Girls. Um, on the right, a sculpture that I am dying to have a place to show by the artist Selma Burke. Um, we have continued to collect the work of women artists. We've also made it a priority to collect works by African American artists at Philadelphia to really change the diversity of voices in our collection. Selma Burke, an extraordinary artist, and um, this particular work, um, you know, I believe is a response to Brancusi's Kiss, which is one of the great masterpieces of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Selma Burke was one of these artists that haunted the museums and galleries and you know the security guards would have to say excuse me ma'am uh the museum is closing it's time to leave she was so glued um to the galleries of our great museum and i think you really see that in this um incredible rendering of of an embrace um that will have a, a pride of place um, moment in saint michael's um and I, I also just wanted to describe and i um this is like news to me as of three minutes ago, a uh, community, uh, really five minutes before this presentation started, I got an email from my friend Stephen Arasati in the conservation studio. Um, you know, not only the Red Rose Girls, but the Philadelphia 10, very important group of women artists. This is a recent gift to Woodmere um, from my friend Myron and my friends, Myron and Corinne Yanoff what I think is the killer painting by the artist Suzette Keast, um, one of the artists of the Philadelphia 10, um, a, you know, a, a group of women artists who supported each other, who showed together, who organized exhibitions of their work together. And um, you can see how Stephen has lifted, um, you know, a film of brown gravy off of this otherwise very colorful painting again. You know, this is an artist who, you know, was inspired by that coloristic energy of Carl's, but took it to a realist place. Um, and, um, you know, I am just flabbergasted by how incredible the painting is. Um, it will have a space, um, you know, in St. Michael's Hall. But, you know, this is to say we are already at work on the conservation of works of art that, you know, need to get ready for prime time. Um, our goal is to open the building in the fall of 2024. So there's a great deal of work going on behind the scenes on um, preparing art um, to be shown. The top floor of the building um, is the space that's perhaps most chopped up. We are hoping to remove all of these, all of these partition like walls and there are a lot of bathrooms and things up there on the top floor. Um, we will remove all of that and create an open space um, that will be dedicated to prints, drawings, photographs, and the illustration arts. And again, um, the, the, the story in Philadelphia of photography, prints, and illustration um, is very significant. And these are stories that need to be told and that Woodmere needs to tell. Um, lower left, Ben Rose, who um, you know, a leading figure in photography in Philadelphia who became part of the Warhol Circle, um, taught for decades at the University of the Arts. That, that's in the lower left, an example of photography um, in Woodmere's collection. Ben Spruance, um, The City at Night, again, one of the most important printmakers in American art, lived in Chestnut Hill. Um, we probably have, well, we certainly have the largest collection of his um, paintings. We have a very large collection of his printed work. And then in the lower right, Jerry Pinckney, um, portrait of Jackie Robinson as a Brooklyn Dodger. 
Jerry Pinckney, again, one of the great illustrators of American art, grew up in, in Germantown and has been a family member um, at Woodmere forever. Jerry recently passed away, but um, the opportunity um, you know, to be able to have a place where his work can live at, at St. Michael's Hall is incredible. You'll see that you know, we, we plan to take the sloping roof, the sloping roof line of the top floor, take advantage of that space and fill the spaces with flat files where Woodmere's great collection of works on paper can live and serve as um, you know, a study center for um, this largest portion of Woodmere's collection. 70% of our collection um, is works on paper. Something new and I'm getting to the end of the galleries, um, a jewelry vault. I am incredibly excited to um, be creating a gallery that tells the story of jewelry as it evolved in Philadelphia. And I'm showing a work on the left by Joe Pilari, who for decades was a, an anchor in the jewelry department at University of the Arts, Doug Bucci on the right at Tyler, and um, you know, Philadelphia has two of the great schools for the making and the craft of jewelry and jewelry as art. And um, this is a story we need to tell. It goes back to the 18th century and to the English silversmiths who came from England, from London mostly, to, to Philadelphia. I'm showing um, a, a fancy bonbon spoon by Bailey, Banks, and Biddle um, on the left, and then the detail um, on the reverse, a, a, a bonbon spoon um, from the 1870s, probably the type of object that Bailey, Banks, and Biddle would have included in their display at the Centennial Exhibition. But the point here being that jewelry in Philadelphia evolves out of the craft tradition of silver you know, the hand crafting of silver. And I, I just love the back of that spoon and how you can see um, that twisted silver connects the, the handle and then in the main scoop. Um, and many of these silversmiths took the leap into jewelry making. And in the lower right, um, a beautiful tourmaline hand carved um, art deco pin by Caldwell, again, one of the great jewelry houses of Philadelphia, which started out as you know, a tableware silver shop and they converted into the making of jewelry. And again, um, Caldwell, um, major force in the presence of jewelry in the centennial of, um, in the centennial exhibition of 1876, Caldwell, Bailey Banks and Biddle continue. You know, these, these are, are, are jewelry makers for America from the early 18th century um, you know, right up to the middle years of the 20th century. They don't quite get modernism, but um, what happens in Philadelphia is, you know, we've got artists connected to our city like Alexander Calder in the upper left and Harry Bertoia next to him in the upper level there who are modernist artists who love making jewelry and they inspire a generation that again, um, you know, coming back to University of the Arts and Tyler School of Arts, um, Olaf Skugfors, a, um, that's, a, that's a pin in the lower left, that circular shape in Woodmere's collection, a silver pin by Olaf Skugfors, um, Albert Paley in the center, um, Skugfors, you know, establishes a, 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 a jewelry program at University of the Arts in the 1960s. Um, Stanley Letson is his counterpart at Tyler, who founds the jewelry department at Tyler. The two of them produce the great jewelry, the great artist, Albert Paley. That's an Albert Paley pin in the collection of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and then our own um, Sharon Church, a jewelry artist of today, who again, um, is coming out of this tradition of the Paley's and Scoopers and Letson at University of the Arts. So there's a great story of craft and tradition in jewelry making in Philadelphia. And, you know, I couldn't be more excited than, you know, to have this opportunity 
um, to tell this story, which is much more complicated than I just presented it to be. There are many, many more voices, but um, a great house like St. Michael's Hall would have had a vault in the basement, a safe for things like jewelry and furniture and china and silver. And we want to be able to create that kind of experience. So um, that is all I'm going to say about the art that's going to be um, in St. Michael's Hall. And now we want to shift our attention to what does it mean to create this museum, um, to convert a building that was originally a, you know, a home, a residence in the Gilded Age, served as a residence for the Sisters of St. Joseph's, but what do we need to do um, in order to convert this building into a museum? And there are a number of um, moves that we um, that we have to do in terms of um, the functioning of the museum. And there are a number of moves, I would say, that we strategically want to do in terms of um, making this successful and moving Woodmere forward responsibly um, from a fiscal point of view in terms of you know, the earned revenue that we'd like to create to be able to drive the museum into the future. So, um, you know, when you think, and, and, and again, Germantown Avenue on the bottom, Green Tree on the top of my slide, Sunset on the right, East Hampton Road on the left, um, we have to create parking, number one. Um, we need a loading dock um, for the museum, and we need a delivery entrance to get trucks onto the property. Fortunately, we've got um, an entrance on Germantown Avenue, and we've got an entrance on Sunset. Um, Darren Damone from um, Andrew Pogon is going to talk more about, about those aspects of the changes that we have to bring to the site. Um, an elevator. Um, to be a public institution and a museum, we must um, offer access to the different floors of the building in an elevator. That is a tricky bear of a, of a process for this building. Um, Matthew, Teresa, and La are going to be talking about the elevator and the elevator placement, um, a cafe. Um, I wish I had a nickel for every time somebody asked me if they could get a cup of coffee at Woodmere. Um, we are planning to create a cafe um, on the site, as well as an auditorium, an auditorium to enhance our education programs, as well as our public programs and, um, and community programs. We want the auditorium to be an extraordinary um, community um, asset. So um, Matthew Baird and his team are going to talk about the building and the changes to the building. Darren Damone and Andrew Pogon are going to talk about um, the changes to the landscape, parking, the loading, um, and, and, and all of that. But first, we're going to hear from Jeff Krieger, um, who is really the person, um, uh, uh, you know, working with the city, with us, and, and, and driving so much of the hands-on part of this forward. So um, I am going to um, stop speaking, but um, I'm, I'm going to sort of give the floor to Jeff Krieger, even though I'm going to continue advancing the slides. Jeff. Okay. Thank you, Bill. You know, the more I listen to you and your enthusiasm for the collection, most of which is unseen, the, the more excited I get about being involved in this project. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Yes. Thank you. Um, so as Bill mentioned, you know, we are the local architects on the team working under Matthew Baird, architects from New York. Um, they've got a great team of consultants assembled. You'll hear from a few tonight. Um, but just a, a very quick introduction about, about our firm and how we became involved in, in this project. So uh, we were approached in the summer of 2020 by a group of near neighbors who had gotten wind of the potential sale of St. Michael's Hall by the Sisters of St. Joseph. They were extremely concerned that the property might be developed in a way that was not conducive with their residential neighborhood. 
as everybody on this call is well aware, there's tremendous development pressure on Chestnut Hill um, today, and it's been this way for the last few years. It's, you know, we're all in just an incredibly desirable place for people to live. Um, so we were brought in to assess the property and understand what was possible where the primary goals were to preserve the building and to preserve the landscape to the extent possible. Uh, so one of the first things we did was just look at, at the zoning, which is RSD3, single family zoning for very small lots, and to understand you know, what would be possible if this property were to be sold to a developer with a maximum profit as his or her ultimate intention. Next slide, please. So um, this is actually a hypothetical drawing of how many lots could, could be legally created as of right on this property. And it's about 23 parcels. They're very small. The homes that would be built there would be quite small. And yet this could be done without any zoning variances and hence without any input from the community, the neighbors or the stakeholders. This was not at all what the, the neighbors who had retained us had in mind, but they needed to understand the possibilities. We looked at the, at the convent building. We thought about whether or not it could be turned into several elegant condominiums. We ran an economic analysis and determined that the renovation costs really just could not be justified in term, from a return on investment standpoint. And that would have meant building a few additional houses on the property. Um, but ultimately the neighbors determined that they, they really did not wanna be developers. They wanted to preserve the property and, and the outcome of our study back in the fall of 2020 and into 2021 was that the highest and best use for this property would be for a nonprofit institution to acquire it with enough financial resources to preserve the building and minimize development on the four acre site. And lo and behold, about the time we wrapped up our studies, Woodmere Art Museum came to the fore and learned of the sale for the potential sale of the property and negotiated with the Sisters of St. Joseph. And you can only imagine what the outcome might have been had Woodmere not been able to close a deal on the property. They're, they're just the best possible stewards that I can think of for this mansion and four acres of open space with some very special landscape features that, uh, again, you'll hear more about from Darren. Um, so we think this is a tremendous win for the community to have an institution like Woodmere as stewards of the building, of the grounds, to have be it open to the public and to outlast you know, us, our involvement in the project and to stand for generations to come. Woodmere's vision aligns very much with the near neighbors and presumably with many of the community stakeholders who are preservation minded, both in terms of the building and the open space that we all treasure. There are challenges to preserving the building, preserving the grounds. And again, you'll hear a lot more about that from Darren and from, from Matthew. Yeah, but it is a Gilded Aid man mansion that was added onto multiple times on multiple levels. It was never intended to be an art museum. And so there will be some alterations necessary to make it into a 21st century building with full accessibility that meets today's building codes. Um, but that's, that's the architectural challenge and um, Bill and Woodmere's board have assembled you know, a team that is definitely up to the challenge. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Darren Damone from Andrew Pogon, who will talk to you about the proposed site enhancements. Thank you.
Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> well, uh, again, my name is Darren DeMono, principal with Andrew Pogan Associates. I have an office here in Philadelphia. Um, we're super excited to be part of this project. Um, really transformative, working with a really um, progressive client and an amazing design team on a, on, a, on a really wonderful project that we really feel great about. So, um, Bill, you could uh, advance one slide, please. So we're going to talk, um, Bill touched on this, but uh, I just wanted to touch on again the fact that, you know, we really started this process by thinking of this as a, as a, as a, as a campus. And, um, you know, from a site programming perspective, looking at how um, St. Michael's and the associated four acres could really um, supplement um, and develop synergies with a lot of what we are already thinking about doing um, and is you know, soon to be underway on the art museum property itself. And that had to do with um, both functional uh, you know, spaces in terms of amenities, but also uh, from an ecological perspective, which we'll talk a little bit more about, but again, Thinking this strategically as a as a as a um, as a you know arts and education campus is, is was our first um, you know you know approach to the to the project itself. Uh, next slide, though. So this is just as a reference point for everybody. This is an existing aerial photograph of St. Michael's Hall. Um, we did overlay the uh, existing site survey, so you can get a sense of. Uh, existing tree cover topography, which we'll talk a little bit more about, but general, again, just a reference point to understand, you know, the relationship of open space to, to the built, uh, built aspects of the property, both, you know, paving and, and structures themselves. Next slide. So as part of our initial site assessment, you know, we always look at the, you know, the advantages and the challenges of each site. Um, and this this site certainly had so many amazing advantages in terms of the, the site and building character, um, the mature specimen trees that exist on the site and the, the framework that they create for the open space and the, the pastoral nature of the property. Uh, we touched on the relationship with the existing Woodmere um, property and thinking of this as a, as a campus and the connectivity between those two and how we build off that. And obviously the, the proximity to the Wissick Valley Park, using it as a reference point and an analog for um, you know, landscape approaches, you know, from an ecological perspective. And then the next slide, we talk a little bit about the challenges. Um, and we did quite a bit of due diligence going into this project, you know, getting a clear understanding of the age of the infrastructure, particularly the sanitary system. Uh, we've been working with closely with Jason Lubar and Morris Arboretum on understanding the condition of the existing tree canopy and, you know, understand that there are um, some areas where there is um, decline in some of those trees. Uh, one of the, the real issues, you know, for us when thinking about the connectivity as a campus was the fact that there were no dedicated pedestrian access points. This site was really, um, uh, you know, centered around the vehicle. And that, you know, trickled down to your experience and the, the drop off, the arrival sequence, things of that nature. Um, you know, and looking at the, the anticipated program in the building, there's obviously inadequate parking at this point in time. And there are, as you saw from the, the aerial photographs and the overlay of the survey, a number of areas of steep slopes, several of which are areas where we, we could not touch because we are in a Wissick and watershed. Um, so that definitely played into the, the design approach, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about on the next slide. So these are, before we get into and start unpacking the actual site design, I just wanted to talk briefly about some of the, the overarching site goals um, for the property. Uh, first and foremost was really acknowledging and responding to adjacencies. And what I mean by that is making sure that the interventions that we propose on the site, whether that be parking, um, you know, open space, you know, things of that nature, that they actually respond to um, our near neighbors, um, you know, whether that be um, an institutional use or a residential use, we want to make sure that the decisions are appropriate and respond to those adjacencies. We also, when you start getting into the details, you know, coming up with thoughtful design solutions, 
that are again respectful of our neighbors when we talk about things like um, you know site lighting or um, delivery drop off loading things of that nature you know being respectful and responsive to um, the surrounding um, neighborhood was really important again uh, working with Morris Arboretum you know thinking about ways we can actually enhance the estate trees that are on the property through selective management you know in some cases it's uh, pruning in some cases it's removal um, and then pivoting towards a palette and a planting approach that favors more native species, which you would see uh, in the Wissican, for example. And then also, you know, when it comes down to site infrastructure like stormwater management and things of that nature, you know, taking a, you know, the, the, the most passive approach possible, looking at clean infrastructure and things of that nature, minimizing the amount of built infrastructure um, for the project overall. And then, as I mentioned, uh, trying to increase biodiversity. Right now, the existing land cover essentially is turf, um, which isn't, isn't conducive to habitat. It isn't conducive to stormwater management in a lot of cases, particularly on steep slopes. So really moving that towards in some areas, um, you know, meadows and, and uh, other planting areas that are more conducive to um, uh, fostering biodiversity. So next slide. We'll talk a little bit more about the details. So specifically about uh, site circulation as it comes to vehicles. As Bill mentioned, we are maintaining uh, curb cuts along Germantown and uh, East Sunset. Uh, they will be widened um, to accommodate for two-way traffic. Um, what will happen is you'll have two-way uh, traffic um, in and out uh, on Germantown as well as East Sunset. But what happens coming off Germantown is you immediately are diverted into a one-way loop um, where you could either park or drop off and then cycle back through. And then it becomes two way towards the east side of the site where it eventually merges with the um, loading or, or drop off zone and service zone that, that Bill had mentioned that leaked down into the uh, loading area directly adjacent to the building, which again, the point of that being bring it as far into the site as possible so we can mitigate any impacts to that. You notice from a parking perspective, we. We're, we're trying to minimize the amount of paved surface and we're trying to decentralize the parking so that we can um, basically manage water um, and microbiome retention facilities, you know, as close to where it falls, that water falls on the site as possible. Um, by breaking it up, it allows us to use planting to buffer and mitigate the use. Um, it also, in a lot of cases, allows us to preserve um, some of the existing trees within these pockets or pockets of parking as well. So on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the pedestrian circulation. Uh, so from a pedestrian perspective, I, as I mentioned, um, we really wanted to create a couple of access points for pedestrian access off Germantown, which we've done, um, both at the north and the south end of the site. And then you enter into a, a main pedestrian network uh, of fully accessible paved um, uh, paths that, that meander their way through the site. Uh, the layout of these paths was mostly driven by um, the, the location of existing trees being um, cognizant of their root zone and minimizing the disturbance of those root zones, as well as topography. Um, you know, using you know those con those contours to dictate how these paths meander um, through the site. And thankfully, we were able to by using those strategies, we were still able to maintain a series of paths that are uh, five percent or less, so there won't be um, the need for any handrails that obscure your views through the site, so it will remain fairly pastoral in nature. Um, and then beyond those main pedestrian paths, we're also, you can see there's a light sort of dashed line, introducing a series of more ephemeral, ephemeral um, garden paths that will be mown. Um, they're able to change over time through the seasons. Um, they allow you to experience different areas of the landscape that might not be fully accessible, like the meadows. Um, so we're really, really excited about how um, that all played out in terms of the site planning. Uh, the next slide, we will talk about major open spaces. And they are basically break down to three spaces. We have a garden terrace, which is sort of a multi-use outdoor space that Woodmere has the opportunity to use for events. This is a fairly flat terrace, which is really conducive to that particular use. We have the main uh, entrance terrace, will, which is uh, essentially the confluence of a lot of these um, 
pedestrian circulation paths as well as the main drop off um, from a vehicular perspective. And then to the east of the site, which is nestled in between the existing building on site and a new multi-use auditorium space will be the new um, children's garden, which will be a focused sort of outdoor learning um, space that really responds to the interior programming of, of, of both of the buildings. So next we will talk a little bit about um, some of the, the really fun aspects of this project was, was um, getting to uh, work with and cite several um, pieces of sculpture that were donated Woodmere for this particular project. And um, this was fun in the sense that we, we were able to, to really dig in and do a lot of research on these individual pieces and think through and really understand how they wanted to sit on the landscape and exist within the landscape and be observed by visitors of Woodmere. So the first piece is, is on the rocks. Uh, it's Robinson Friedenbaum sculpture. And um, the geometries might look familiar because it's the same sculptor that created Whitewater, which is on the existing um, Woodmere site. And this definitely played into our thinking about unifying these, these two properties of the campus in the sense that Whitewater really reacts and, and, and functions as a anchor point and a visual wayfinding point for folks along Germantown. And we thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to use on the rocks in a similar fashion um, for the St. Michael's Hall property. You can see a stylized view of that in the lower right-hand corner. Um, so it becomes a visual, uh, a wayfinding element and an anchor point for, um, for St. Michael's very much in the way that, that Whitewater does for um, the museum property. So next slide, you'll see uh, the uh, syntax, which is a Steve Tobin sculpture. Um, this, in terms of the criteria that we used for citing this, was really had a lot to do with its, its form and its texture. So while it does have a front and a back to the sculpture, it, is, it provides a lot of interest, whether you're right next to it or from a distance. Um, because of its form, we did want it to sit sort of plainly on a, on a, on a clean surface, if you will. Um, so we, again, sort of created a somewhat stylized view in the lower left-hand corner. You can see how that might be cited. Um, because it's, it's round and it does not have a, a foundation, um, we felt it could sit on a, on a slightly sloped surface. So we did choose the sort of uh, northern corner, um, which, is a, which is a lower portion of the site. And what's nice about that is, um, it, again, becomes an element that draws visitors into the landscape. It's, it's sort of an object that you see in sort of a broad sort of broad strokes but as you approach, you get a sense of the texture and the construction of the, of the sculpture itself, which is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting aspects of it. So moving on to the next slide. So Bonewall um, right now is the one sculpture that we have an initial thought on the location, but it's a little bit up in the air in terms of exactly where it's going to go. But in the same way, um, you know, this, uh, the form of the sculpture actually lends itself to the topography of the site. So uh, again, it doesn't have a, a foundation to it, but it is a curved element that sort of rises up out of the landscape. So we very much see this being cited in a way um, that sort of works with the landform of the site. Um, and ultimately uh, it wants to be located again next to a path because as you get closer um, to this piece, it becomes more of a, an element of discovery and understanding the the construction of the actual um, the sculpture itself and how it was actually created um, is, in my mind, one of the most interesting aspects of, of this piece as well. So next slide. Okay, so um, this is one, uh, one of the only uh, pieces that we felt really um, did need an actual flat, uh, flat portion of the site. It's uh, got a fairly, you can see on dimension, it's got a fairly large base to it. Um, it, it, it is an element that we feel works well with, um, you know, sitting within a, a planting palette. It does have a front and a back to it. Um, so we feel, you know, in that sense that the location of it um, can really help to extend, extend space in the sense that coming out of the, the front door uh, of the museum and looking out over a sort of a manicured landscape and then having a backdrop of planting, as you can see in the lower left, um, really is what 
uh, you know, makes this sort of the, the most compelling uh, or, or creates a, the most compelling aspect of, of this particular piece. Um, so we see this working very much as a sort of in a, in a garden, um, garden setting, um, creating a, a bookend, if you will, to the space um, that is the main entrance area of the, the, the landscape design. Next slide. And last but certainly not least is uh, Sweet Grapes. And um, Sweet Grapes um, is a really interesting piece because uh, it is uh, of a dancer. And while it feels and looks somewhat static, it actually, the origins of it, you know, we really wanted to um, reinforce this notion of, of movement and dance um, with this piece. And so one of the, and, and one of the, the, the construction of it is actually, um, it is designed to act as a fountain. So you can't see in the image, but the, actually at the base of this sculpture um, is an opening for water to come out of. So one of the um, ideas that, that Bill had put forth early on in the process is that let's sort of recreate this or, or reinstate it as an actual fountain element. So we use the, you know, in our research, you know, use this notion of, of movement um, to inspire um, the new sort of platform for this, which was ultimately um, going to become a fountain for the main centerpiece of the, the entrance terrace for this, this new property. And on the next slide, you can see um, some of the initial thinking um, for this, this piece and uh, the fountain element that surrounds it. So you can see um, one of the things we wanted to do here, and you can see in the sort of plan view that's in the upper right, is we wanted to maintain a certain aspect of the, the historical drop-off, despite the fact that we were no longer inviting cars into the space. We still wanted to honor a portion of the, the form of that, that historic drop-off. And this fountain and the formation of this plaza and these sort of curved lines really allows us to do that. Um, and it also, from a functional perspective, allows us to do a couple of really important things, which is provide universal, universal access um, for those with disabilities that might be either arriving by car or arriving through the landscape through this network of, of accessible paths. And um, you can see probably best depicted in the upper left-hand corner this sort of crescent-shaped series of seat walls that really embrace um, the, the, the water feature that sits at the feet of, of sweet grapes. And what's really nice about this is it, it the, the sort of this idea of movement really radiates out um, the inspiration of this, this, this fountain and this, and this um, sculpture radiates out. And we use that as the inspiration for the creation of a lot of these geometries that you see um, and it's a rival plaza. And you can see even in the formation of the, the water feature itself, you have these series of tilted planes that you know water comes out of the fountain and then starts to swirl around ultimately to the, to the base of the fountain itself, which um, actually also functions as a seat wall. So um, we think this is a really you know, a great balance um, of, of space. And um, while this isn't sort of fully flushed out at this point, we're really excited about the direction that this is going at this point. So if you go to the next slide, uh, we'll cap this all off by talking a little bit about planting. As Bill touched on, um, there are a number of sort of zones right now that we're thinking about for uh, the overall property. Um, we touched a little bit on the, the, the uh, sort of lawn space and there will be lawn that's preserved mostly in that um, the, the lawn terrace that's adjacent to the outdoor amphitheater and event space that's being preserved on the property on that terrace. Um, there also will likely be um, larger expanses of lawn within what we're calling the grove. And this is the main um, the sort of bulk of the, the mature specimen trees that are on the property right now. And again, the idea is to minimize earth disturbance, preserve the root zone, preserve the health of the trees. And the best way to do that is to, again, minimize the amount of disturbance, um, whether that be earthwork or, or planting in a lot of cases. So the grove will be mostly intact. Uh, in the areas of the north where there are a lot of steep slopes and there may be issues with managing water, we are introducing um, a series of meadows um, 
while that while they will be implemented from a planting perspective, rest assured that sledding will be still very much in play uh, in the winter time in those meta areas. So we're again we're not um, uh, altering the the land form at all in that particular area. Uh, so along the north, uh, northwest, and northeast, a lot of the the basics will be mostly intact. Uh, and getting to the the southern end of the site. Um, this is where, as I mentioned before, because of the parking, because of the service, um, these are the areas where we're going to focus on most heavily on woody planting, creating a series of buffers, both you know mixed evergreen and deciduous and flowering, understory vegetation in terms of shrubs, um, to make sure we are uh, mitigating any negative impacts that are created by um, parking, loading, drop off. Uh, things of that nature. And this is also the area, again, because of that, that paved surface, while we are going to make an attempt to use as much porous paving as possible, um, we are anticipating these buffer areas will also manage the lion's share of the runoff, um, any runoff that does occur from these uh, particular paved areas. And on the next slide, we'll touch a little bit more on the specifics of some of these uh, mature trees. And you can see again, uh, the bulk of these uh, mature trees, and they vary from um, native to introduced European species, but nonetheless, they create some amazing spaces. So the intent in these particular spaces is to minimize impacts as much as possible. And you can see um, by the, the, the spread of the canopy of the trees, how amazing the space will be um, once you're able to sort of negotiate these slopes um, through these, these accessible paths. So that is it for landscape. With that, I will turn things over to Matthew to talk a little bit about architecture. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Darren. It's great to uh, be here um, speaking with the community and, um, and it's an honor to, to work with Woodmere um, Museum and um, Jeff and Krieger Associates, um, Darren and Andrew Pogan. Um, some of you may have come to the original uh, informal uh, community presentation. Um, and if you were there, you would have heard me talk about um, uh, some of the things I'm really excited about with this project. Um, as a kid growing up in Chestnut Hill, I, um, I remember, um, of course, lots of great architecture and being um, taken around by my parents to see some of it. But I also remember uh, a kind of a collective loss of, of things that had been torn down and, and, a, and a, a sort of a, a sadness about, should we have done more to keep those things? Things, buildings like White Marsh Hall, uh, the original Lavrock, Meller, Megs and House, probably most famous project, which was raised. Um, and then more recently, um, the Lavrock um, of the uh, Lloyd Starr estate. And um, these things, uh, at least the first two, weighed on me as a kid. And, and to be a part of a project that actually um, preserves and, and, and enhances a, a great piece of historic uh, architecture um, is meaningful on, on far more than, than a professional um, level for me. So um, we're excited to talk about the architectural interventions and um, recognizing that um, we've, we've probably gone past our allotted time. I'm going to um, jump right in and I'm actually gonna go backwards uh, to the last slide that Darren had, if that's okay. So we can just look at the site plan really quickly from an architectural point of view. Um, and, and Matthew, let me say, yeah. please take your time. I mean, we sort of advertise this as a, you know, a, a journey through. So, you know, very often we are constricted by time, but please take the time that that you want. Okay, thank you. Um, so, if if um, if I may, just point out, um, you know, incredible uh, piece of architecture, 1850s original house, which is this center block load-bearing, uh, massive uh, masonry construction, and then later additions that were brought uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, 
And um, what's interesting about the project that, that we're engaged in is that from Germantown Avenue uh, here, um, and also uh, from, from the, the entrance here, um, the, the, the original facades, our plan is to restore. So a lot of this will be um, uh, taking care of some masonry, uh, uh, attending to roofs and gutters, uh, and um, perhaps some new windows, um, and uh, really bringing this building into the next uh, 100 years with um, a robust um, strengthening. Um, and, and then when we think about ways by which we can enhance the program of the experience of the museum, um, most of the engagement is actually in this uh, back quarter um, where there's a real opportunity to open up the museum to the landscape um, and, and present new program um, that doesn't exist um, in the confines of the historic structure. And then the, the project, the architectural challenge will be, how do those two things relate? This new uh, engagement uh, with the landscape, this opening up of the museum um, with that historic fabric that is quite beautiful. And so that's what we'll be talking about tonight. And um, I'll just jump from there back into our slides. Um, the first slide is, a, is an image that we sketched only last week um, everything that you're seeing uh, are, are early, early, early schematic design. So um, we present these um, as a sketch, as a work in progress. The idea um, uh, on the, on the uh, garden side of the museum is to open it up to the landscape and provide a new uh, program. Uh, we're actually going to uh, uh, do four significant interventions um, on this side of the structure, and I'll walk you through each of them. Um, let's go first to um, the next slide. This is a bird's eye view of the back of the building. Um, we're going to be restoring the, the uh, porch that you see here. Uh, over the uh, course of the hundred years that uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph's um, occupied and, and took care of the building. By the way, um, they did an amazing job at, at caring for the structure. When Bill and I went in in July and pulled up rugs, we found beautiful wooden floors that had been well-maintained in 1920 and hadn't been seen since. Uh, there were um, the, the, the attention to preservation each year um, was significant. And so it's really thanks to them that we have a structure that's largely intact and really hasn't been um, uh, tarnished by uh, lots of incidental renovations. Um, one of the things that, that was done was the enclosure of this side porch and also another flanking side porch. And our current proposal is to open those back up and, and restore them to the historic um, porch that existed uh, when the house was a house. Um, and there'll be uh, furniture there for taking in the landscape and occasional tables where you might have a picnic. Um, so that's part of the preservation program. Um, and then the four interventions really relate to, and I'll go through them, we can advance the slide. First, an elevator. Um, and. Um, as Jeff Krieger was saying uh, before, and I think Bill also mentioned it, um, the historic house, uh, this rectangle, this square piece of masonry um, has three floors, all level. But um, when the 1900 edition was made, it was at, at a time when complexity and uh, was linked with the bucolic. And so the idea of shifting floors uh, was very attractive. Uh, and we didn't have um, ADA accessibility rules back then. So um, there was no uh, thought for, would you ever need to put in an elevator and how would you connect all the floors? And we found this one uh, pinwheel uh, space where we can fit an elevator. Um, and it, it allows us to provide access to each of those um, different floor levels. 
And so we're putting in a new elevator at this um, uh, uh, position in the back of the building. And the hope is to make that elevator largely transparent so that you can see through it and um, so that it won't block the front hall's view of the landscape. Let's go to the next slide. Second intervention is an art uh, loading dock uh, that is covered from the weather. This is an important, um, very important part of the museum. And um, it's, so the idea is to be able to bring uh, trucks in uh, to back them up to a loading dock and safely um, offload art into the museum and uh, close to the um, vertical um, lift. So that's the, the second key intervention at this side. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, the third uh, is a cafe. And uh, there are lots of great places on Germantown Avenue to um, meet um, and, and have dinner and lunch. Um, but there aren't so many places where you can meet a friend or a colleague for a quiet cup of coffee and um, maybe get good Wi-Fi for free. Uh, so I think this could be an amazing um, gathering place for the community um, and um, the place where you could uh, come um, see some art uh, and, and um, have a little um, relaxing uh, moment in the cafe surrounded by this spectacular mature landscape. The idea um, is to make a pavilion that's um, capable of, uh, I think we can seat now 48 people. This is not a big uh, restaurant. Um, we have a few extra seats at a cafe uh, coffee bar, um, but the hope is that we can make a beautiful little gem of a building uh, that could be opened with large sliding doors uh, and could be set on a tray uh, of, of landscape that is a, a grass roof so that you could open the doors and actually have an indoor outdoor experience that this cafe um, space could, could actually be almost like a porch itself. Um, if the museum is closed on a Monday and you still wanna have a cup of coffee, the idea is that you could come along the porch and enter this little side door here. So the, there is some thinking about how do we um, have this, uh, space available to the community uh, on uh, days that the museum might be closed. Um, let's go to the next uh, couple slides. Um, and that's just a, a, a summary of the, the whole exercise on the back, the elevator, the cafe, uh, and the outdoor space. An important thing that's not in that slide, if, if you wouldn't mind just going back, Bill, is that from this level, uh, we're going to um, provide access to the landscape. Um, and that's a work in progress, um, what the, the quality of that staircase might be. Um, but the idea is that you'll be able to enter uh, in the front of the museum, see the beautifully restored uh, facade, pass through the open porch, and then eventually get down to the landscape. And um, if, it's a, if it's a snowy day, um, hopefully bring your sled uh, for some ongoing sledding and um, fun uh, in the gardens. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, we can look about the auditorium. Um, another important piece of the program is a collective space that's um, good for lectures and a gathering of, of a, an intimate uh, scale. Uh, this is an auditorium design for about 85 people. Um, that number has gone from 65 to uh, just under 100. Um, and, um, but the, the idea is not to make a, a, a huge uh, a concert hall, but rather a place for an art presentation, uh, a lecture by a visiting uh, curator, um, a, perhaps a, 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 a small music uh, jazz ensemble. Uh, although Woodmere does that pretty well uh, just down the street. So, but it's a small venue um, for um, community gathering. And uh, the idea behind this building is to make it largely a landscape element, um, employing a, a, a grass roof, a green roof, 
um, and taking cues from the hip roofs of the historic building, uh, we came up with this um, inflected triangle that um, is the roof of the building. A little hard to see here, it's pretty subtle. Um, but we wanted to make a building that was engaged in the landscape and that didn't um, challenge the existing architecture. Um, so that is the, the auditorium. We have another view if you want to advance. This is the view from the um, parking lot side, sunset side, showing the entrance and very, very uh, schematic at this point. But the children's area of the museum is here and they will be able to come across their terrace and enter a set of doors on this side. And then those who come in by car uh, could uh, enter these doors. Uh, and then as you get into the uh, auditorium, you'll uh, cascade down a raked floor uh, to um, underneath this uh, green roof. And I think that's it. That, those are the four things, elevator, loading dock, cafe, and auditorium. And, and those are the those are the slides and that's the presentation that we brought to share and I think we're now you know very happy to answer questions um, that anyone might have um, and Standish I'm yes I'm I have the there. questions you bet so we'll, we're going to do them in chronological order the first question is and I direct this to Darren what are your thoughts on bench placement so if I, <clears throat> I think I understand that question. Um, I assume that's bench placement throughout the property and that's something I didn't really touch on, but there will certainly be um, plenty of opportunities to provide um, seating with, within the landscape to be able to, you know, as you're meandering these paths to be able to sit down and just immerse yourself in the landscape experience. So those aren't shown in the plan. We're sort of not at that level of detail yet. But that's certainly something that's in the back of our mind. It's something that will be will be provided in the design for sure. Thanks, Darren. And that's absolutely what we've been discussing. Uh, the next question is: What are your thoughts for a concept connecting a Woodmere theme on the non-Woodmere property sidewalk along Germantown Avenue that connects the two properties? Something that's also been discussed much by the team. Um, Bill, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I can. I mean, I, I, I really do love the idea that Darren shared tonight and shared with me um, just a few days ago of, you know, positioning, you know, the Robin Friedenthal on the rocks at the corner of Hampton Road in Germantown to really, you know, serve as a, you know, a beacon that connects to the whitewater sculpture at the corner of Bells Mill Road. I mean, as a kind of visual connection that connects the two sites. Um, in terms of, you know, the walk, those 72 steps from corner to corner, um, one of the things that we're thinking about is some kind of a, you know, of an audio program, a walking tour that, um, you know, we're, we're thinking about, you know, walking, a, you know, sort of an audio tour of Woodmere's main campus, an audio tour of the St. Michael's campus, and an audio tour that could be something that people listen to as they're making the journey between the two. Um, you know, I, I would love to think about um, sort of decorative or creative interventions in terms of, you know, exciting ways to, you know, rebuild the sidewalk or, um, uh, you know, make it a creative journey and build something creative into the physical um, into the into the physical space that connects the two projects that's just not going to be part of our scope now and so far as it involves the streets department and it's you know it's, it's not a small project to make even a small intervention on public sidewalks so for now we're not going to be engaging with you know physical changes in the public space between the two buildings but we are thinking about digital interventions um, Woodmere has a very popular podcast called Diving Board, and we're talking about diving board episodes that can be listened to as, um, you know, sort of a journey between the two spaces that might be historical about 
Um, you know, where is it that you're traveling and what is the history of this space? Um, but also talking about, well, okay, you're, you're leaving Whitewater behind and you're arriving at On the Rocks. And, you know, what are those two sculptures about? And, and who is Robin Friedenthal? And, you know, why do we care so much about his work? So um, that's some, those are some of the thoughts that we have right now for thinking about connecting the two sites and the experience of a person that will wish to walk um, from one site um, to the other. Well, Bill, the next question is about sculpture. Yeah. And um, this person says a very important step for Woodmere, congratulations. Puzzled about the proposed outdoor sculpture. Are these works already in the museum's collection Woodmere has been developing? And uh, um, yes. Yeah, so the answer is yes. Um, these are gifts, uh, all of the sculpture that you saw um, in Darren's slides um, are gifts to Woodmere that we own. Or that 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 we will soon own. It, it no, might no. be on some of them that we haven't signed the papers, but they're right. gifts from from their gifts from very very close friends of these. Two. Yeah. So and um, they um, on the rocks is currently on the property at um, yeah. Woodmere, and the others are are coming. Are on their way. <laughs> yeah, literally. Uh, um, the next person um, says this is fabulous. Will the recording of this presentation? and or PowerPoint be available to this audience? Yes. And I said, yes, it's recorded. And our last one is also up on our website now, and this one will be added as well. Uh, the next question is, will vehicles be allowed to turn left out of parking onto Germantown Avenue, or will they be rooted to sunset and around the property, ultimately to Hampton? Darren, do you want to speak about that? And our traffic engineer is not on this call, but is available. Yes, I was I was going to say we are currently working closely with the traffic engineers to look at all of this. Um, <clears throat> they anticipate at some point doing a traffic study that looks at the context of the property and understands sort of traffic as it relates to um, the anticipated parking and, and use of the property. So at this point in time, the thinking is there would not be left turns outside at, at coming out of the museum onto Germantown, um, but Perfect. that you are that, not allowed to make a left turn either right. from Sunset or from the driveway of the property. Now, right. I have stood there and watched. Yeah, we have all the time. Um, and the next question is the exact same um, theme. Um, sun, um, sunset is tricky for pedestrians, especially during school drop off and pickup. Has this been considered as part of the project? Um, Darren, I know, again, the traffic engineer. And the second part of that question was water runoff has always been an issue, but even so more during the last year or so. What will be done to mitigate this during and after construction? Uh, you know, we will mitigate whatever runoff is, is, is generated by this property in terms of the improvements um, that we're making. Um, you know, the aim, as I mentioned, is to use passive means to do that, to minimize the amount of infrastructure that's required to manage that water, but we will be, um, you know, responsibly managing, you know, all of this stormwater runoff that occurs on, on our property. Uh, and we will, and again, the traffic engineer is very involved in all these. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, the next person is asked, I'm not sure if I followed about community entry into the cafe. Does one need to pay for museum entry first? or can one go directly to the cafe? Also lighting needed for the Germantown sidewalks between Woodmer and new facilities, safety concerns, and assume community might be able to use auditorium in evenings. It's a lot of questions there. I think multiple people might answer those. Um, so um, we are thinking about the cafe having an independent life um, separate from the museum that, um, so, so yes, there will be times when um, the cafe is open to the public and the museum is not, and we are are encouraging that. So that that was that was question number one. And so, Bill, to answer that, the, one does not need to pay for museum entry to go to the cafe. Correct. Correct. And um, then the lighting is the next question for safety concerns. Lighting along, I'm sorry, lighting along Germantown. Avenue. 
the person asked also lighting and not this is an anonymous attendee also lighting needed for germantown sidewalks between woodmere new facility safety concerns you know i, I again i i you know to, to to make lighting interventions in public streets is be you know i have to be honest and say it's beyond the scope the street the department um that 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 um um i have mentioned to a couple of our neighbors that i love that there are some hedges that might be cut back a little bit so that the you know the, the walk is um is 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 not encumbered by a branch here and there um you know it, 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 you know, I just have to be honest and say it is it's just not going to be part of the scope of work to make those kinds of interventions on the public sidewalk at, at this point. Um, uh, and then the last part of that question was the community might be able to use the auditorium in the evenings. Absolutely. We are thinking about the auditorium as a community asset. Um, and, 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 you know, part of what makes it so um, so exciting to have um, a museum like Woodmere and Chestnut Hill is that we have great partnerships with schools, with um, the community organizations, the business association, the community organization, the conservancy, the Friends of the Wissahickon, and um, we, we, we very much feel that the auditorium can be a community asset. Um, um, I'm going to merge at the movies um, and, you know, the idea that we'd have a place to show a movie in Chestnut Hill that's an honest to goodness um, auditorium is um, very exciting to me. <laughs> um, to all of us, yeah. To all of us, um, especially Ralph Hirschhorn. If Ralph is yeah. on this call. Um, I'm going to merge two questions because they're rather similar. One person saying is, will it be possible to walk between Woodbury and the new building without going out to Germantown? And the next question was, do you anticipate a pedestrian entrance pathway from Green Tree Road and Hampton Road? So, so I think we could merge uh, those two questions. So again, I, I think it's, it's a very similar answer. There is, um, I mean, it is certainly possible to walk along Green Tree Road and come to the back space of the property. In fact, it's even a little bit closer on the Green Tree side of the property, you know, Green Tree Road is a country road. There is no sidewalk there. And, um, you know, I do not, again, you know, it is not the scope of this project to, to re-sculpt the, the space, you know, along those, those, those public spaces. It can't, I mean, it just can't be. Green Tree is a lovely road. Um, we want it to stay a lovely road. Um, we will use our voice um, as we do um, currently at Woodmere, um, you know, when the city has made changes on Bells Mill Road, we are right at the center of the conversation and we are advocating for the improvements to the public spaces that you know, we as an institution and the community, um, we believe, you know, sort of want and together share. Um, but as, as, a, as, a, as a part of the scope of this project, um, you know, we're not going to take on, um, you know, the, the, the question of, you know, should Green Tree be changed in any kind of way? Um, currently, there is no sidewalk. It's a country road. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I have to feel that um, those who live on Green Tree Road have, you know, you know, ideas and thoughts about that um, as well. And many of our neighbors from Green Tree, thank you, are on this call. Um, this person is saying, I love Woodmere. I'm a member and live in Chestnut Hill, but I'm always amazed and disheartened how few people outside of the immediate area know of the museum and or have not visited recently in many years. With this wonderful new expansion, what is the museum doing to expand the visitor population? Bill, you can answer that because we have an exciting answer. Well, um, you know, my my true belief is that this opportunity um, to be able to have permanent galleries for Woodmere Woodmere's collection will change the visibility of the institution across the spectrum of museums. That the museums that you know we should really think of as Woodmere's peers and 
um, you, know, you, you might hear me say this and say, what? But, you know, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, a museum, you know, founded by, a, a, you know, a founding collector with a strong personality in a historic home with a permanent collection that, um, you know, needs to be embraced and seen. It's, you know, there is a cohort, you know, across the country of uh, museums that share those aspects. And I think that, you know, with the visibility of having Woodmere's collection on view, um, you know, Woodmere becomes a place that it becomes a destination that um, visitors um, from out of town want to see. Um, in the 12 years now that, that I've been the director of Woodmere, um, we've seen steady growth year by year in attendance. Um, you know, it started out um, in 2010 when I arrived at Woodmere, there was somewhere between 12,000 and 15,000 visitors a year, which is quite low. Um, we're up, well, before the pandemic, I should say, we had about 50,000 visitors in 2019. Um, we're rebuilding that now. I mean, we're seeing our audience start to come back. So um, I anticipate that um, there will be greater attendance um, at Woodmere, you know, just because of the expanded offering and the expanded program. Um, you know, a children's drop-in art studio, a place that a family can come to on the weekend and know there's a creative hands-on project to do. Um, you know, I believe that's, you know, that, that's going to be unique to the region and something that I believe, you know, family audiences um, will embrace. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to make a prediction of like how many more people will it be, um, but, you know, I, I, I would say that, you know, we don't want Woodmere to become, you know, a large, you know, we, we don't want to expand beyond the scale um, you know, that feels right for Woodmere's identity. I mean, Woodmere's main building and St. Michael's Hall were both built as homes. And that kind of welcoming experience, that sense that this is a home that is now a museum, that high touch kind of friendliness of the institution is something that we want to maintain. So we don't want to become a big professional museum. Um, we want to you know, we want to maintain that spirit of a great historic house um, that was transformed into, into a museum. So, um, you know, Woodmere wants to serve more people, but we don't, um, you know, we don't foresee, um, you know, um, you know the, the kinds of, um, the kinds of attendance that you see, you know, on the parkway, you know, at the, at the, at the large museums. Um, in downtown Florida. Um, and adding to that comment, um, I, we have an increased, we have a wonderful plan for increased um, stories in the media and more telling our story even better as we have an even bigger story to tell. Um, certainly, you know, we, we look at communicating even more with our audiences, both locally, regionally, and nationally. I agree. Um, Woodmere has a lot of great stories to tell. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and we have a plan for it. Um, so stay tuned. Um, another question um, or comment is, um, I think that the sloping roof over the storage building invites kids as well as adults to climb it. Any thought to enable this to be part of the experience? I can answer that. Um, and I, I would say that we have to be really careful to make uh, a, a building that's fun for kids, but also safe for kids. And um, this is something we'll have to, to, to take into consideration. And one thought that we've had is to create a kind of ha-ha uh, capability brown landscape move where uh, parts of the slope roof will be accessible up to a point, and then there'll be a gap that you won't be able to cross what we don't want to do is have handrails up the side of the, the auditorium because that would defeat the purpose of making it a subtle landscape move. Uh, so we'll work on that. Uh, make it climbable where it's safe and, uh, and then keep it safe uh, where it's too, too high for, for kids to wander. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, yeah. Next question, which is an excellent question. Will St. Michael's have a gift shop as well as the original Woodmere Museum? 
Bill, you take that one. Yeah, so um, no, the museum store will remain um, you know, where it is in Wood, on Woodmere's main campus. So just as there will be a cafe at St. Michael's and there'll be a museum store on the main campus, um, you know, the, 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 the operational elements will complement each other. The next question is, will the public be able to rent spaces in the building for private parties? Um, we do foresee that there will be opportunities, um, you know, for, you know, the cafe, for example, um, to have a private party there. It's, it will be, you know, a dedicated event space and, and um, you know, we're going to have to work out, you know, what nights of the week is it um, dedicated to museum activities, what nights of the week is it dedicated to, you know, just say being a cafe, and, you know, what nights of the week might it be available for special events. We have to work that out, but, you know, that's, that's part of the vision. And, you know, the auditorium, you know, could, you know, could it be rented out for a corporate event, say, or, um, or, or meetings? Um, absolutely. Okay, the last question is really more of a comment. Um, thank you for all of this. I'm looking forward to the opening in two years. Uh, yeah. We are too, and we thank you for asking that comment. Uh, that's it for the questions. Uh, Bill, do you just want to wrap this up? Well, I, I just want to say, you know, every time I'm together with the team, Darren, Matthew, Teresa, Jeff, um, look, that I'm just, you know, blown away by the incredible, uh, you know, creativity and talent that, you know, has come to bear on this project. I mean, it's incredibly exciting to me and humbling to me, um, just, um, you know, how beautiful this is and what a dream come true for you know, a museum to be able to spread its wings in this way and to do it in, you know, such an elegant fashion. So I want to thank all the panelists and I want to thank everyone who's um, spent, you know, the evening with us. Um, it's uh, coming on nine o'clock. So this will have been a two hour presentation. Um, I see that, you know, we we're still over the hundreds mark. So thank you to everybody who spent um, you know, spent time with us tonight. And, um, you know, we truly do feel the um, extraordinary partnership, um, you know, with all of you. So, so thank you. Um, this presentation will remain um, up on, it's being recorded, it will go up onto Woodmere's website. Um, please continue to channel questions um, in our direction. We're you know, glad to um, gather ideas and feedback, and that's part of what fuels the, you know, the momentum. And, um, and stay tuned. There will be more community updates. Um, we are working with the community association um, on their review process, which again is an opportunity, you know, for everyone in the community to engage with this project. And um, and again, we thank you. We thank everyone who's a panelist, and we thank everyone um, who's watching at home. And please come to Woodmere. We have great exhibitions on view right now, and I look forward to seeing you all very soon. I guess with that, we're going to say thank you and good night. Unless any panelist, um, you know, would, would would like to offer any remarks. I think with that, we all say a big thank you to all of you and enjoy the rest of the evening. Have a good night. Thank you.